So I wanted to bring you here to meet Ralph and his boys because they represent some of the oldest horse riders on a reservation. Goes back generation after generation to the point where their relatives would would ride horses into battle against the U.S. government, and now they carry on the traditions of the horse riding through rodeos and through uh, wild horse racing. You never want to be in front because that's where they're going to strike you with. Bam! I'm getting well, a little bit nervous. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, you know, and he senses that. This is where we practice stopping. I'm just gonna ride my horse down and jump off my horse. Usually in relay race, we jump off and jump on another horse. Okay, right. I guess it's my turn now. So that's like uh, stop, catch, and dismount. Yeah, I got this. It was not as uh, scary as I thought, but yeah, it's a powerful beast. I got one question. Mm. Was he smoother than the kangaroo you rode in on? <laughs> yeah, JD. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker. My full-time gig is uh, telling stories. As a filmmaker, when I travel, I've always got a camera in my hand. I think storytelling is important because it, it creates a voice, especially for different cultural backgrounds. Coming from my own experience, coming from a different country into Australia, it's always been a matter of trying to fit in and trying to adapt to the culture. Part of my story is that I was born in the Philippines. And when I was five, my mother went to work one day and I wandered off and got lost. And eventually I was adopted by a new family in Australia. And I've always had this feeling that there's something missing in my life. So I've landed in Spokane, Washington, in the Pacific Northwest of the US. And I met fellow filmmaker and Native American, Ben Alex Dupree. Little did I know Ben Alex would introduce me to some of the most intense spiritual experiences of my life and help me reframe how I deal with loss. Right now we're currently walking near the Little Spokane River. So this is like a, an important gathering place for indigenous people because there are several tribes that are surrounding this whole area. And the waterways that come down through the middle of the city are representative of our traditional gathering places. I think Ben Alex was quite an interesting dude. He kind of lifted the, the whole myth around native culture being stuck in the past. Indigenous culture isn't about a specific rigid pathway that doesn't move, doesn't change. It's more about a reflection of our universe and that everything is expansive and moving. Indigenous culture is constantly evolving, it's changing, it's embracing new things, and it really is about futurism. So when we talk about the indigeneity of our, our planet, it really is about the positive changes that we can, we can come up with. And, what we can do to save this planet. Ben Alex invited us to the reservation to meet his family. I met Uncle Rick, who is an artist, a musician, a self-confessed hippie, and grew up here on the Colville Reservation in a family of 10 kids, plus five more adopted kids. How are you doing? Rick, hey. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right, come on in. And I just make up crap so that nobody can tell me that I messed up. I said, well, I just made that up. <laughs> I got this one I finished a while back. What is tradition? I don't know. I always try to tell people that I'm not traditional because what people see as traditional, you know, you live a certain lifestyle and it always has to do with past history. If I was trying to follow that traditional line or whatever, I wouldn't be using acrylic paints. I'd still be trying to carve on stone walls or something, you know. I was introduced to the work of an artist named Fritz Scholder. He says, in order to be Indian artist, he says, you don't necessarily have to paint Indians because why would you have to do that? You're, you're just you. 
It made me realize that, you know, I didn't have to constantly paint somebody with a war bonnet or dancers or anything like that. I can paint anything I damn well want. Up here. Sit up. The importance of family, it Sit can't up. be stressed enough. We lived in a two bedroom house. So it was naturally there was people, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins and 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 it was just like a pack house all the time. And this was natural to us. You'd have a friend come over and visit, you know, non-native, and they were like, God, there's a lot of people here, or you know, geez, you know. And a lot of them would love it, you know, they'd think it was great. You are you're always gonna have family, and that's the first one you turn to. And if you have family members that are having real, real hard times or whatever, everybody's there to step up. Listening to Uncle Rick reflecting on his family really makes me more determined than ever to reconnect with my family and get in touch with my Indigenous Filipino roots. My first impression of Dan was that he just had this really beautiful aura about him. Well, our, our dancing is our relationship to the earth. The drum beat is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. So when we dance, we're portraying that, that way as, as men. We're hunters, we're warriors, we're protectors of our people. This is our eagle wing, Melkanoops. So all these thoughts that you have, these prayers, we lift them up. Raise your staff up, so you have no fear. And you flow like the hawks. <laughs> so our powwow culture, where we gather and we dress in traditional galia and we dance, that is a place where you enter the dance arena and you become a man on the dance floor. Yeah, I always share with people that uh, when I first came to Australia, dance was actually my first language because I came to Australia when I was six and I didn't have any English. And the way that I sort of understood people was through their body language and through movement. And it was movement that kind of got me out of my, my shell. Traditional dancing in our culture is similar to hip hop in that they kind of blend together in different styles. Though it's very traditional in our hearts that we find ways to personalize it. In my 20s, dancing all over the world, no matter what country I was in, everyone knew the language of dance. Our ancestors were able to live just with the knife, you know, and, and they were able to go out there and know what foods to eat. They also had a relationship and respect, reciprocation, you know, with the land. And with the modern day culture and society, those things are often overlooked. And uh, we don't appreciate things as much as we used to. We don't appreciate each other as much as we used to. And uh, that goes back to the relationship of time, spending time, you know, as human beings to learn from each other. So sharing a meal is very important because that allows us time in that relationship to grow as friends. I've traveled across the nation, I mean, I, I've driven far as 24 hours straight, you know? And you, you travel and you come across different people's territories. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you knock at the door and, and they won't, won't offer you a bed or a meal or anything, and you just keep, you have to keep traveling. It's really hard, life on the road. So that's what I offer to create here is a safe place, you know, and also a place to heal it. So that's why we have a sweat lodge here. I've had different people come through who battled addictions or people who were grieving, you know, from loss. They come here and you know, just offer a safe place that they could rest and take care of themselves and get their mind right, get their spirit right, get back on the path. We have a prayer ceremony here tonight, take care of ourselves and more than welcome to come join us. A sweat lodge is a sacred Native American tradition in a small hut representing the womb of Mother Earth, where water is added to hot rocks to create an atmosphere similar to an intense sauna. 
Come in with an open mind. We'll help guide you through, you know, the best that we can. And you are welcome, my brother. You know, come and join us. But, you know, having a sweat lodge, you know, is a private matter. So sorry for the cameras. You know, they won't be following us. I think when, when you travel, there's people that come into your life for a reason. And the minute I met Dan, his aura was just, it, it really, I've really felt it. For Dan to invite me is quite an honor. Uh, I have no idea really what to expect. I'm, I'm nervous, but I feel like something extraordinary is gonna happen. This is pretty cool because people don't really get invited to sweats, especially if they're not from a particular area or tribe. So this is really special. I'm excited for Joel. We carry the teachings and the spirit of our ancestors with us wherever we go. And we bring, you know, what we call our spa'us, our heart, and the heart of a culture that has existed for thousands of years. And we go and we meet other people who feel the same way about their own world, and we share that. And that exchange is that healing, that bridge. I never expected this sweat lodge experience to be so profound. There was a point in the sweat, sweat lodge that I felt like I was going to die. All sorts of sounds came out of my mouth that I wasn't even making on my own. It was, that, it was the exact feeling that I had when I lost my mother in the Philippines. And that's, that sense of loss and that sense of like that she didn't love me anymore. I felt the earth in my feet. The earth was just pulling, pulling my feet down into the, into the ground. Even though I had lost my mother, it was like, the earth was like, the same, like, but I'm here. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Culturally, if we live life thinking that we're missed out on something, then we don't get to see and love everything that we have, you know? It is a paradox. And you have to teach your mind to enjoy what you've been given. <laughs>